Our scripture today is from Joshua, chapter 3, verses 7 through 17. You can read along in your pew Bibles if you like. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, Draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Parasites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now select 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above shall be cut off. They shall stand up in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the ark of the covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest, so when those who bore the ark had come to the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap as far off as Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon, while those flowing from the sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all Israel were crossing over on dry land, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. The word of the Lord. So you thought, just because you had a two-week break from Pastor Jesse, that we were going to forget all about this story of the people of, of Israel, right? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, see, I didn't want you to be left hanging, not knowing what the end of the story was, right? Um, so thus far in our study, we discovered how the, the children of Israel came into being, we found out how they became slaves in Egypt. We talked about how Moses came and delivered them out of slavery into freedom. We learned about the Hebrew people, how they struggled to find their identity in the wilderness and how they established this close, deep bond with God while they were in the wilderness. But did they ever get to the promised land? Well, clearly they did, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here this morning, right? Um, but we didn't get to travel that journey together with them as a church family. So here we are. Uh, now, the last time we saw the Hebrew people, they had received the law of Moses, and God told them that if they followed the law and kept it in their hearts, they would be able to... Uh, get that reward, that long-promised reward of being able to go into the promised land. Well, finally, after 40 years of wandering out in the desert, here we are on the banks of the Jordan River with the Hebrew children just poised and ready to cross over into that promised land. What has changed since uh, our last visit with them, is that Moses died, which was so beautifully illustrated by Connor here. He died, and what happened was that uh, Joshua became the leader of the people. Now, Joshua was actually a military person. Joshua was one of 12 spies that were sent into the promised land to give the 
Hebrew children an idea of what they were walking into. And the problem is, is most of those 12 spies came back and they were afraid. They were telling the Hebrew people, listen, this land is occupied by giants, serious bucks, giants. And there is no way that we're going to be able to uh, occupy this land with all these giants here. But God's message to the children of Israel was, be strong and courageous, do not fear. And so Joshua took this to heart, and he wound up being the one who would lead them across the river into the promised land. Now here's something about this passage. This passage doesn't get a whole lot of attention. Uh, I, and I don't know why either, because it involves a miraculous crossing over a body of water, uh, very similar to what it was like at the beginning of the Exodus story. The people entered the wilderness by this miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, and they're just about to end their journey with a miraculous crossing of the Jordan River. But you don't see any big epic movies about this water crossing, do you? Uh, but, but think about it, okay? Crossing a huge body of churning salt water like the Red Sea is impressive. In movie terms, you better have a pretty big special effects budget to pull that one off, right? Here's the thing about the Jordan River, though. Most filmmakers could use a pair of beavers to build a dam upstream, and it would work out just fine. Uh, the river is just not that big. In fact, the, the picture on the cover of your bulletin, that is the Jordan River. In fact, that's the Jordan River when it's really, really flowing, okay? It's just not that big at all. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. See, the exodus began with a water crossing, and it ends with a water crossing too. In that way, it's, it's a critical part of the story because it's the end of a journey. Now, we're all familiar with beginnings and endings and everything in between. As people, we are familiar with this. Because think about the times in your life where you have experienced beginnings and endings. Like, uh, we, we begin uh, our public education with kindergarten or, or grade school, and we go along, and then we hit this finish line where we're finished. But is that the end of the story? No, it's not the end of the story. In fact, it's just the beginning of a new story, because then you go into junior high or middle school, and you go for another couple of years, and then there's another finish line. And I don't know about you, but, but in my day, here at Chico Junior High, they put on this big thing with balloons, and uh, play, what, what's the song? The, it's not taps, it's thank you, pump and circumstances. Oh my gosh. So, so they, they play that, and there's all of this pump and circumstances, but that's not the end of the journey either. Then they go into high school. And, you know, when, then life is just a series of beginnings and endings. There's choices you have to make. You know, college, military, vocational school, other educational opportunities, other milestones, other skills to learn. And as you go on in life, relationships form, relationships end, kids move out of the house, sometimes they move back in. And then out, and then in, you know. <coughs> you find jobs, you lose jobs. Friends and family live and die. You go through periods of good health. You go through periods of illness. And through it all, you may be struggling <coughs> to find your place in the world with all of its challenges and all of its changes. But where does it really end. So at this point in their journey, the people of Israel were, uh, they were different than that little ragtag group of Hebrew ex-slaves who made a difficult and hazardous <coughs> crossing into this unknown wilderness. They were no longer the frightened people wondering if maybe they weren't better off living as slaves in Egypt. Yeah, they were scared. Yeah, they were 
hesitant to enter into a potentially dangerous land with giants and everything, but they weren't fleeing from an army of angry Egyptian soldiers. In fact, they were a lot closer to God than they were when they started the journey. They learned how to live by faith. They learned to live in times of scarcity. Uh, they were tougher. They were more seasoned. They were more ready to hear the voice of their new leader who told them, be strong and courageous. When they escaped from Egypt, they learned that the crossing of the Red Sea was not the finish line of their journey to freedom. In fact, if anything, it was the starting line for a whole different leg of the journey. Now the, now the people of Israel could have said, as they, as they stood on the banks of the Jordan River, they could have said, well, you know what? After 40 years in the wilderness, we've, come, we, we've become pretty good at camping. We're good campers. We really don't have to cross this river and settle in this land of, of massive fortified cities populated by giants. We're fine. You know, we, we can't, we, we can do this. We can just camp out here with God. We're doing just fine. We did it for 40 years. Why not? Why ruin a good thing? It could have stopped right there, but it didn't. Uh, the other day I was volunteering over at KZFR helping out with their annual fund drive and someone in the room referred to me as Pastor Jesse. And one of the volunteers answering the phone says, Pastor Jesse, well, what church do you serve? And I told her. And she sort of got this funny look on her face. I thought, uh-oh. She said, oh. Well, I belong to a small group, let's call it a spiritual focus group, uh, that, that wanted to meet over there, and when we went to the board, they didn't seem too interested in letting us or anyone else use their building. And God bless her, the woman sitting right next to her at the table said, Are you kidding? That's where Shalom Free Clinic has their mental health care. I volunteer there every week. And, and sometimes they give us their leftover food from the fellowship time. And once a month, once a month, they make sandwiches for the volunteers and for the clients. And then the two guests that I had who were going to go on the show with me, both of them were from CHAT, Chico Harry, uh, uh, Housing Action Team. And they're like, yeah. And they've, they've let us use their building for safe space shelter for the last couple of years, sometimes for two weeks during the winter. And of course, I had to throw in my two cents worth too. And I was like, oh, and we've got a Hispanic church and a Syrian Orthodox church that meets there for worship and uses our facility. And then that woman next to her said, yeah, there's always something cool going on over there. <laughs> and so this woman kind of smirked and said, oh, so I guess you're a cool church now? And I said, no. We've always been a cool church. <laughs> It's just that our ministry priorities change over time as God leads us. So when did you ask us about your group using the church? Oh, well, it was a while ago. Okay, how long? Well, probably 20 years ago. <laughs> and I says, well, you know, we've been thinking a lot about what God is calling us to do. And we came to the conclusion that we should focus on reaching out and being a church who serves our whole community, not just the folks who are members. See, every, every church and every person, every individual, is on a journey, whether we like it or not. We travel along from season to season. We face new challenges as the world around us changes. And on those journeys, we learn some valuable lessons. And you know what? Sometimes those lessons are painful. Amen? Sometimes they're subtle. Sometimes they're mind-blowing. Uh, we mosey along until 
we get to the shores of a new river, a new challenge, and when we're listening to that voice of God saying, be strong and courageous, we stop and say, you know, we can't just keep doing things the way we used to do it. Circumstances change, and so must we. And rather than throwing up our hands and saying, well, I just want to go back and keep doing the same old things on this side of the river until I die, we say, okay, how do I, how do we make it to the other side of this river for a new challenge in this journey? So yesterday I was in the kitchen and the kitchen crew at the bazaar started re reminiscing about folks who've passed away that used to help out. Um, they were saying, hey, remember when Frony used to come to the bazaar and bring, what was it that Frony used to bring, Barbara? The chicken casserole, that was it. Remember when Frony would bring the chicken casserole or those pies that Elsie made? And we were joking about having a retro bazaar where we would bring all the food from the past that we used to love and have it, you know, some year. And it was fun reminiscing. It was fun hearing some of those stories of those saints and what they used to bring. Um, some of these people I, I never knew because they died long before I got here. But what I thought was really neat is that no one said, oh, no one in the kitchen said, oh, I wish we could go back to the days when we had more people who helped. Or, I wish more people would come to the bazaar. Why, I remember the days when people lined up all the way back to First Avenue to get in. Nobody really said that. I'm just trying to illustrate a point, okay? <coughs> what I heard folks talking about was how thankful they were for the new people who've pitched in to help with the, and, and the new goodies that have been served. Uh, and I heard a lot of people saying, man, that apple crisp was awesome. Uh, and, and our folks who keep up with social media were saying, you know what it looks like? Maybe we have more people this year than that we had last year. Maybe it's because we've been utilizing Facebook and social media better this year and, and to get the word out. <coughs> For the people of Israel, the crossing of the Jordan put a closure on this 40-year nation-altering, nation-forming event. Uh, the start of the journey at the crossing of the Red Sea and the end of the journey at the crossing of the Jordan River. Those, those were the bookends. But the crossing of the Jordan wasn't an ending. It was also a new beginning. And as the crossing of the Red Sea was a new beginning for the children of Israel, the crossing of the Jordan is just a prelude to a totally new chapter in the history of God's people. A, a, a chapter that we are still a part of. And as the Red Sea washed away the identity of Israel as a nation of slaves, Jordan's water washed away their identity as, as wanderers. Crossing the Red Sea, God was shown as the one who liberates. Crossing Jordan, God is shown as one who provides and provides abundantly. Both of those aspects are so important when we talk about the character of God. And forged out of their experience in the wilderness, those Israelites, they received a new beginning, a new crossing, a new mighty act of God where the, where the chaos of water is harnessed. In life, and in ministry, we, we can always find bookends which mark momentous occasions. Occasions of birth and death, comings and, and goings, loss and gain, grief and joy. And we can also find events which propel us forward into new and exciting beginnings.